Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello and welcome to episode six of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different from the rest. It's going to be a solo episode. I normally interview folks, but this week I wanted to do a solid reflection or perhaps even a rant on something I've been thinking a lot about, especially in the past few weeks. So today's episode is entitled, What's Wrong with Indie Publishing? Okay, maybe the title should actually be Three Things That I Think Could Improve Indie Publishing, but but let's be honest, uh, the first title has a bit more of an active voice, and it's a little bit more controversial, and hey, if it got you to click on this and listen to this, then, then I suppose that worked. I'll be back next week with an interview, and I have some amazing guests coming up in future episodes, but for right now, you are stuck listening to my personal rant and reflections on potential solutions to what's wrong with indie publishing. This episode has been sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices provides all the tools that an independent author or small publisher needs in order to get into the digital audiobook market. With tools for directly uploading your own professionally produced files, to providing a platform where you can project manage working with their global pro narrator talent pool, this easy to use platform allows you choice, such as setting your own prices, and why distribution that includes retail library and educational markets. I know I've certainly been surprised by where I'm earning money via Findaway Voices, and I encourage authors and small publishers who are interested in getting into the audiobook market to check them out at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. I know that the title of this episode is What's Wrong with Indie Publishing? But the purpose of what I'm trying to do is to support and help self-publishing, indie publishing, and all the amazing opportunities that come out of the evolution of publishing in all of its aspects. I love self-publishing. I actually started in this space back in 2004. Back then I used Ingram Lightning Source to make a POD or print-on-demand version of my previously published short stories. It was called One Hand Screaming. That experience opened up my eyes to the possibilities that occurred when you didn't have to wait for the gatekeepers of traditional publishing. My eyes opened further when I created a Smashwords account and a Kindle Direct Publishing account just a few years later. And yes, I was self-publishing on KDP back when the going rate was 35%. Kindle only increased the royalties to 70% in response to Apple coming into the self-publishing space. Most people don't know that. And that's what leads to my first point. Issue 1. Power versus Responsibility. I just got back from a writer's conference that takes place in Colorado Springs, Colorado. It's called Superstars Writing Seminars. And next year, 2019, it'll be celebrating its 10th anniversary. I've been attending the conference as a guest instructor for the past five years, And one of the things I like so much about it is that it's about teaching the business of writing. I think that's really important, and here's why. Digital publishing has removed the gatekeepers of traditional publishing. You don't need approval from someone sitting behind a mahogany desk in New York to say that you are good enough to be published. I love that! You can create a free account at Amazon, at Kobo, at Apple, at Nook, or at Smashwords, or Draft to Digital, or one of a dozen other great aggregators who'll distribute your book to retailers, and you'll have your ebook live on those retail sites in anywhere between 3 to 48 hours. But to quote from Jeff Goldblum's character in the original Jurassic Park... Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. We have given writers the ability to push the buttons, to publish direct, this amazing power. 
but we haven't given them all the support, all the information, all the elements to help them make intelligent and informed decisions. We haven't helped them to wield that responsibility. Yes, Kindle and Kobo and Smashwords and all those other places do their best to point out best practices. There's a plethora of amazing information out there from these companies and from so many other great independent authors and service companies, places like Reedsy, who help curate professional talent. But authors can also, and often do, bypass this great free information and can be led down the wrong paths, making costly mistakes to the detriment of their pocketbooks, their long-term careers, and potentially to those original dreams of being an author. The only players that seem to invest heavily in attracting newbie authors are the sharks, the predators, the author solutions style companies out there whose business model isn't to make money selling books. It's making money off the hopes and dreams of authors by selling them snake oil, selling them unnecessary marketing packages, etc. That's why conferences that focus on helping provide writers with a well-balanced perspective of traditional publishing and digital publishing, including self and indie publishing, are a goldmine for writers. I just left this conference where the core faculty members, Kevin J. Anderson, Rebecca Mista, David Farland, Eric Flint, James A. Owen, and Brandon Sanderson, a group of authors with hundreds of of years of writing and publishing experience in among them. And yes, a decade or two of those years include indie publishing, digital publishing, and direct-to-consumer selling. They're all experienced with both sides of the publishing spectrum. They're there not only sharing, but they're also learning, just like I was. I've been in this industry for more than 25 years, and I'm still there to learn just as much as I am there to teach. To have a seasoned pro like David Farland, the man who mentored and taught authors like Brandon Sanderson and Stephanie Meyer, turn at the end of a panel to ask me questions about my perspective about something. When David does something like this, I take notice. David is a phenomenal writer, an amazing teacher, and he has more knowledge about publishing than most people could ever dream about. But he's always hungry for more info, more insights, and he's willing to listen, no matter where you come from, even though I have less experience than him in general. That's how he got to where he is. Never stops learning in a very professional way. This conference also teaches professionalism by example. The faculty and the instructors are amazing writers and industry folks. They are larger than life. New York Times best-selling authors. But they take the time to listen, to teach, and to demonstrate professionalism, which includes the simple act of being kind, of being generous with their time, and being a down-to-earth person. A part of the professionalism that's being taught at a conference like this it's making an investment in yourself. It's expensive to go to a conference like Superstars Writing Seminar. It can be expensive to hire an editor, a cover designer, etc. But as Joshua Esso, an editor I've hired myself, said when I was handing him my most recent down payment for securing a spot for him to work on my next novel, he mentioned that down payments aren't necessary, but it makes a huge difference when a writer has some skin in the game. He's right. Is it possible that so much of the amazing free information that's out there is being ignored? I love free info. Free is great. It has great purpose. We use free to hook people into reading our other works that they'll buy. Heck, this podcast is free information. But think about the last time someone handed you something physical, perhaps at a conference, for free. It could be a free ebook, it could be a free print book, it doesn't matter. The fact that it was free means it's easier to ignore, to cast off, to forget about. But what if you paid for it, even if it was only a dollar? 
Did you attend to it a little bit more carefully? Did you read that book that you got for free? Or just let it collect dust somewhere in the back echoes of your Kindle library? I'm not saying that you should go and pay lots of money for information or lots of money to attend a conference, but I'm saying that you should consider the time you spend either attending something like that in person or in reading the free content that so many people willingly offer on their websites, Joanna Penn, Mark Dawson, Nick Stevenson, or the wonderful info shared online in various writer forums and news groups. Consider the time that you spend absorbing this information as an investment. It costs money because it took time away from your writing. And attend to the great information that you're being given. If you paid even a little for that advice, would it be worth more to you? Would you weigh it more carefully? If you paid in either money or an in invested time, would that put more effort into leveraging that info and those insights? Advice comes and goes, but information abides. Don't be afraid to attend to it. Don't be afraid to remind yourself that investing time in absorbing that information and that free information has a cost. So absorb it. Adapt it into your own needs as if it cost you money. Because it did cost you money. And if you absorb that information, you can be prepared you can be informed, and you can wield that power with greater responsibility. Issue 2. The Mainstream of Indie Publishing It's funny when you look at how indie publishing represents this amazing evolution in the publishing world. Self-published authors, indie authors, are so proud of the fact that they are independent pioneers bravely venturing into bold new territories. Well, my own experience within publishing shows that the way indie authors are growing and evolving today, which is quite awesome, is not all that different than traditional publishers. Indie authors often scoff at traditional publishing, both ignoring the latter's great power when it comes to physical book distribution, and forgetting the fact that they actually have more in common with traditional publishing than it at first appears. In 1927, Bennett Cerf and Donald Knopfler had a passion for books and stories, and they said that we were just going to publish a few books on the side at random. They founded Random House Publishing which became one of the largest traditional publishing houses in the world. How different is that from what indie authors are doing now? Publishing those stories that they want to get out into the world, either doing it on the side while they're working a full-time job or potentially dreaming that one day they can leave that day job. In the 1930s, Penguin revolutionized publishing by introducing cheap and affordable mass-market paperbacks, and they created a whole new experimental area of publishing for those who couldn't afford hardcovers. It was a whole new market of new readers and an influx of new writers that had to write for this new market. This experiment opened up a whole new industry and expanded many genres in a way that had never happened in the history of publishing. So very similar to the way that ebooks opened up entire new possibilities and new genres and niche markets and sub genres. Speaking of niche markets, in 1924, Richard L. Simon and Lincoln Schuster were listening to their aunt who adored the New York Times Sunday crossword puzzles, and she kept lamenting the fact that she had to wait until each Sunday in order to do them. She loved them so much. They heard this from a number of people, so they pulled their money together to fill a fad, or a very niche market. They published crossword puzzle books. It was the first time that crossword puzzles had ever been published in a book, bound in a book. They were only in places like the Sunday New York Times. This publishing house went on to become Simon & Schuster, another major publishing house. 
The point I'm trying to make is that all of these examples, they demonstrated passion, dreams, pursuing independence and in niche markets, and applying that independent spirit into creating things that grew and that we now scoff at as if they weren't driven by the same things that drive us. Too often today, I'm frustrated with what I see happening in indie publishing. And it's that the term indie is there, but the spirit of independence isn't always there. Have you ever watched a group of five-year-olds play soccer? They're all just chasing after the ball. The ball goes left, the entire mob of kids, doesn't matter what team they're on, follows it left. The ball goes upfield, the entire mob scrambles madly to chase it. In so many ways, that's what I'm seeing happen in the supposedly independent author space, what, what I like to call mainstream indie publishing, because it's just as mainstream with so many people just following along and doing what everyone else is doing. One person takes the ball and is making their way down the field, and the entire rest of the field of players chase crazily after them. A chaotic scrambling. Nobody's playing their own position. Nobody's leveraging their own skills and spots and overall strategies. They're just madly bouncing around the field, mindlessly chasing the ball. I'm going to switch sports for a second and talk about Wayne Gretzky, famous Canadian hockey player, who said that the secret to his success wasn't that he was focusing on where the puck currently was, but on where it would be. He wasn't chasing the puck. He was there and ready for the puck when it arrived. But here's the reality. There isn't a single soccer ball. There isn't a single hockey puck. Yes, you can and you should learn from others. That's critical. You should pay attention to the great experiments that other authors and publishers are doing but you need to know where your own ball, where your own puck are going, where they're going to be, and you need to work towards that. Not at chasing people around the field, not chasing the ball with the mob, but defining your own path. This past week, I listened to Brandon Sanderson give an amazing talk, and in the talk, he shared a joke that he has continued to hear about the publishing industry. He said that the minute a new author finds a way to break a hole in the gate that prevents new successful authors from arriving, the industry madly scrambles to go and patch that hole so nobody else can get in that same way. It's a cute and funny story, but it's, it's sort of true. And it's also true in the indie author community. There's no point in looking for the holes that other people have made and slipped through. Those holes might be closing, either by the saturation of everyone else trying to squeeze through those holes, or maybe those holes are just naturally closing up, whether it's traditional publishing or indie publishing. You need to focus on your own unique path. You need to focus on finding your own unique niche, your own unique holes. Focus on the things that are critical and important to you. Keep poking, keep working, focus on your strengths, focus on your long-term goals. You'd be surprised at how much luck happens to those who work tirelessly in pursuit of their own unique path and vision, rather than those who, like those five-year-olds, are just scrambling madly, chasing the crowd, and hoping that maybe, maybe they'll get their foot on the ball. Mainstream Indie Publishing it's kind of a funny term, but think about it. Are you actually independent in following your own unique goals or paths? Or are you just trying to mock and copy what someone else is doing? Mocking and copying is great. Learning from others is great. But don't forget what's important to you. And don't forget about the critical nature of forging your own path to success, making your own holes, and poking your own way through. Issue 3. Exclusivity. So much of what is possible in self-publishing today is probably because of the launch of the Kindle and specifically the amazing free tools that Amazon created when they released Kindle Direct Publishing. Amazon, though the powerhouse retailer that they are, continually forces authors 
with one of the largest and longest ongoing debates in the indie author community. The debate known as going wide or being exclusive. It's funny that the company that made so much possible, that made it possible for authors to quit their day jobs, to live the dream of being a full-time writer, is also the same company that constantly forces this choice and paints authors into corners. It's this great paradox that frustrates me. God, heck, in some spaces, the divisiveness between going wide and being exclusive can get as passionate and as ridiculous as the violence that happens between the far left-wing and far right-wing division that the United States has been living in the shadow of for the past couple of years. I worry at times that people talking about this going wide or being exclusive is going to lead to people actually coming to blows and hitting each other. That's how passionate I've seen people get. I know there are plenty of authors that are making a killing publishing direct to Amazon and being exclusive to Amazon using the KDP Select option within KDP that gets them into Kindle Unlimited. That 90 days of exclusivity that Amazon requires and appears to almost threaten to kneecap you about if you dare violate their terms has brought some great things to certain authors. And I'm glad that those authors are making great money. Many of them are bringing in five-figure incomes every single month and are easily hitting six- and seven-figure incomes every year. But I would argue that if you are exclusive to a single giant corporate retailer, you can't in all honesty call yourself an indie author. You're not an independent author. You're a corporate author. You are reliant on a single powerhouse retailer for all of your income. Sounds like tough love, but let's be honest, that's exactly what you are. Again, I'm not angry at you. I'm not jealous of you. I probably love you. You're an author, you're a creative person. Of course I love you, but like that tough love. I look at this and I think I'm quite happy that you're able to make this happen. And I'm not going to go about fear-mongering and speculate on what might happen if Amazon disappears or without warning they change all the rules. I'm not going to do that. Everyone does that. Like I said, I'm happy for you. If you're reaching your personal goals for writing, if you are making an awesome income being exclusive to Amazon, that's great. I hold nothing against you. Well, except for the fact that I don't read on that platform, so I don't have access to your books. But that's okay. You made that choice. That's fine. The only thing that I really want to hold against you is your use of the term indie or independent author. I would argue that you can't truly call yourself that. Perhaps there should be another term for what you are. If not corporate author, because that might just be too painful, or, or author whose income is 100% dependent on a single company and whatever whims it chooses, then perhaps just be honest and call yourself an Amazon author. That way it's clear. I'm exclusive to Amazon. I'm an Amazon author, not an independent author. <laughs> I say it jokingly, but part of me is serious. Part of me just wonders about this whole fight between going wide in exclusivity. And I don't really have a solution for this because I truly believe that every single author has to make decisions and follow paths that are right for them. Let's just not use an incorrect term to describe or define ourselves, shall we? Well, that's the end of episode six, my rant about what's wrong with indie publishing. I hope you enjoyed the reflections and speculation uh, of three different aspects of, of challenges that I see in the indie publishing community. And, and like many things, there's no one answer. There's the answer that's best for you. But I had fun debating it and look forward to maybe chatting with you about that either in an online forum or Maybe the next time we bump into each other at some sort of writer's thing. If you enjoy this podcast, please take the time to leave me a review on the podcatcher of your choice. I would absolutely love that. Or share the fact um, that you're listening to this podcast 
with a friend. Again, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing. I appreciate you listening, and I look forward to connecting with you again next week in Episode 7. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com. Thank you.